And now, with Sound Investing, here's Paul Merriman. Well, welcome to what I think is going to be one of the most interesting podcasts and videos that, that, that we've ever done. I am, I am so excited. As a matter of fact, there's a two reasons why I'm excited about this today, because we're going to be talking about how to help a young person get started, whether it's a young person at birth or a young person at 18 or 21. In fact, we'll share a couple stories about people who have already done what we're going to talk about here. And the reason it's pretty exciting to me is because I just found out that in a few months, I'm about to become a grandfather of a, of a, a grand, of a, have a granddaughter who I am going to do for her what we're going to talk about today. So uh, this is exciting to me. And normally, I would probably take this on by myself and 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 go through my, my my sales pitch but i thought it would be more meaningful if if chris Pedersen and daryl balls chris is our for newcomers our director of research and 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 daryl is our director of analytics these two people volunteer hundreds and hundreds of hours a year uh, to the foundation. Daryl is responsible for creating and building some 160 plus tables. And, and, and Chris not only does table work, but he also goes through and creates the best in class ETF. So these people, unpaid volunteers, are working for you as hard as they can. I'm in the same boat. I'm just not as smart about the kinds of things that they do. But I have, of course, the optimism and the mission to make sure that we do all we can to make you a better investor. And in particular, we're trying to help the do-it-yourselfer. You know, somebody who's got an advisor, uh, that advisor is going to be telling a different story than we do, more than likely. But we are here to help the do-it-yourself investor. So let's talk about today. We are talking about putting money aside, either for a young person or the young person doing it for themselves. I spoke a couple of days ago to uh, about 100 Western Washington University students and I talked about this strategy to try to get them excited about how important it is to take advantage of the very early years uh, of investing. And, and, and you're going to see something pretty neat here because you're going to see that, 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 that first five years early on could, in fact, for some people, would be maybe all they needed to invest. But we're not going to recommend that, but I think you're going to be interested uh, in, in how this all plays out over the long term. And by the way, we have to understand the long term is different today than it used to be. 1947, I would have had expected if I was born in 47, I wasn't, I was born in 43, but I just read the article that talked about those born in 1947. They have to expect to have money until 2117 to live on. That's a long time. And that is because today, uh, a child that's being born is going to have a 50-50 chance that it will live to at least 103. And by the way, that's an American. If you're Japanese, it's 107. So that means you spend a lot of years in retirement. And as a caring parent and grandparent, or a, or a savvy young person, this means that we've got to make sure that we have not just enough, but more than enough to last for potentially a lot of years. So I asked Daryl, could you put together something that would show us the impact of, uh, of, of some early years? Let's just say the first five years of a person, I'm talking when they get, let's say they get out of college, that, but that first five years that they make a commitment to something that is fairly aggressive and they make that commitment for life. 
And by the way, for life, is not an unusual thing for a lot of investors to do. A lot of investors invested in Coca-Cola for life. For they invested in, uh, well, unfortunately, Sears Roebuck for life. And so there are great stories of people who invested for life in some equity security. And there are some horrific stories about people who invested in companies that didn't make it. And you know how we feel. We only want you to invest in life in something that we believe the probability of success over the long term is very, very high. And just this morning or yesterday afternoon, Chris laid another table out there about the probabilities of this working that he will be sharing here today that give, I hope, give you the sense uh, that this is doable and something worth taking the risk that we're talking about. So, Daryl, could you give us your table? And could you give us a few words? When I said, could you put together a table, how you did it and, uh, and what it shows? Sure. Let me bring up the screen here. What would happen if somebody only invested the first five years of their career, let's say, when they get out of college or when they, they start working to make a little money or something like that. And so, uh, and if they were able to make, get yeah, earn 12% a year uh, tax-free in a Roth, let's say. So I, I did that. I looked at, at uh, putting in five years worth of $6,000 uh, a year into a Roth IRA or a Roth 401k with no match or a Roth 401k with a 50% match from your employer and do that for five years and then, uh, and then stop contributions. And then when you retire at 65, start taking them out and you do that, take 5% out every year, 5% of the previous year's balance. And you do that until age 95. So what do you end up with at the end of 95? How much were you able to, or at the, at the end of that 95, how much were you able to take out during those 30 retirement years? And what was the total benefit, the sum of those two, uh, of your withdrawals and what you, what you have left at the end that you can pass on? So the bottom line is that if you do this and you can earn 12% a year, you're probably going to be in pretty good shape. Um, the Roth IRA, uh, at the end of, of five years, you have about $42,000. That's, that's what, sh what your investment is worth at the end of those first five years. Um, and by retirement, it grows to about three and a half million dollars. We're down here right now. And so you start taking out 5% of that at, at uh, age 65. And by the time, uh, you reach 95, you've taken out $15 million and your portfolio is worth $22 million still. So your total benefit was almost $38, 000, $38 million. $38 million. So that's pretty good for a $30,000 investment in your early 20s. Um, if you have a Roth 401, 401k, uh, you, the scenario is very similar. You, you don't have quite as much money at, at the starting point when you, when you stop making contributions because you've essentially put them in on a monthly basis rather than all at the beginning of the year. Um, but still, you end up with $36 million. Um, here, here, though, is the real kicker. When you're going and looking for an employer, if you can find one that will match your contributions, that that really supercharges things because you end up with essentially with a 50% match, you end up with essentially 50% and you end up with 54 million at the end. Um, but in the meantime, you've taken out $21 million during your 30, 30 year retirement. You have almost a little over 32 million left at the end. So these are all nominal dollars. And so, so, a loaf of bread now might cost a few bucks, but it might cost 50 
by the time you're 90 years old, okay? So does that mean anything? You know, what, what do these numbers mean? What does it mean in terms of what you could really buy? Okay, so the next thing we did was we took every, every year's worth of contribution, contributions and, and withdrawals, and we adjusted them back to what their value would have been at age 21. So these are real age 21 when this scenario started, real age 21 dollars. And you can see the numbers here, they're a lot smaller, which of course you would expect, but these are these are in terms of what you could what you would have to to spend today, what you could buy today. So you still have five, five million dollars, seven million dollars total benefit. Take out two and a half million dollars or three and a half million dollars during your retirement over 30 years. That's a good chunk of change. This averages out to, for example, here, that's $100,000 a year, almost, a little more actually, uh, average over the 30 years of retirement for the, for the 401k match. That's, and that's in today's dollars, age $21, when you start this program. That's, that's a reasonable amount to live on at that point. If, if you start early, you can really have a, have a much more dramatic impact on your ability to retire with confidence um, at a point 45 years later, 40 years later at 65. And, and of course, Daryl, the things that, that really kind of caught my attention, uh, the first one is when you're talking about a young person and you're talking about building, uh, whether it's a nominal or real dollars, a multi-million dollar retirement, based on this one series of $5,000 or $6,000 investments over five years. They're going to be judging this early on and, uh, and asking themselves, does this feel like I'm on my way to being a multimillionaire? Well, I can tell you at the end of five years, they probably don't feel like a multimillionaire because they have put in $30,000 and the market has made another $12,000 approximately. And this is, this is such an important lesson for young people. And that is that this is truly a partnership. And in the early years, you, the investor, are the important partner. It's not the market. Uh, after a point in time, the market becomes the more important partner in this relationship. And so it, 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 it just takes a time. And the important thing is to figure out a way to explain that to young people and get them to have the confidence. Because as far as I'm concerned, the biggest risk of this not happening doesn't have to do with the market. It is the discipline that, that you uh, are able to help that young person uh, build. And, and I'll share a few stories in a in a few minutes. Now, it's not going to shock anybody to find out that what we think you could over a period of a long period of time, make 12% is is in the small cap value uh, equity asset class. And the beauty of that, from my viewpoint is, we're not depending on a Coca Cola, or a General Motors or a Sears Roebuck, we are depending upon an asset class that has a history that has been as successful or more successful than probably at, at least 95% of the public companies that ever came on the market. Because it's been a very small handful of companies that have been able to compound at more than a 10% compound rate of return. Not even Coca-Cola uh, did. Well, if you add dividends, they did. But if you didn't add the dividends, they, they did not, as it turned out. So my belief is, is that the probabilities are pretty good with small cap value. And, and of course, Chris uh, was kind enough uh, to build another table and, uh, to, and, to, and to look at, at least based on history, what the probabilities are of that small cap value asset class actually making that 12%. Chris, 
do you have the ability to uh, uh, well, maybe before I, I ask for the new the new table, what comments would you have that uh, about this table that we've not mentioned yet? Well, I think it's a great example of buy right, hold tight, don't peek. Uh, so, you know, one of the tricky things about buying right, especially if you're going to hold tight and not peek, is that you need an asset that's going to effectively be managed. If you bought a stock portfolio, you'd have to look at it periodically and figure out which companies were in trouble, which ones weren't in trouble, what to buy, what to sell over time. Um, if you uh, if you buy a small cap value index fund that has low costs and gives you good exposure to those parts of the market, there's somebody doing all that work for you. They're they're doing the work to make sure that it stays a small value fund, that it meets its cost objectives, that it's managed tax efficiently, and over a lifetime, it'll probably change hands. Uh, you know, it probably won't be the same company across a lifetime, but a lot of times when a fund goes out of business, it gets subsumed into another like fund. Um, and if worst came to worst in a tax deferred account like a Roth, you would sell it and buy a different one. You'd stay in the same asset class. So it's just a great way to do this w just wonderful approach of buying something that's got reasonable historical expectations. Uh, and then give yourself permission to look away and and just just hold it and ignore the ups and downs in the market and then be pleasantly surprised when it comes time to tap it. So I, I think it's a, a, a great example of something that a young person could do. And I think it's probably easier for a young person to do with help. Uh, you said you were going to try and set this up for your granddaughter. I think it's easier for somebody to ignore an investment or respect the fact that it's been set aside for the future when it was when it was given to them with that intent. Um, I see that in my own kids. The money that they make on their own has a different mental accounting than money that we've helped them with. The money that we've helped them with, they have a, a certain respect for its intent and and what it will do in the long run and they're i think they're just a little bit more hesitant to spend it and that's a good thing well if i and i would add a story about uh one of the folks has been kind enough to 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 support uh our foundation uh and uh, this gentleman uh for several of his his nieces and nephews has helped them get get started and uh, in the article that's coming out uh, this uh, next week uh, about this strategy, uh, we tell the story about what what he did. We call him Kevin, and 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 his uh, niece's name in the article is Madison. Uh, those are made up, but the dollars aren't. And he is funding for a five year period the $6,000 a year. By the way, if it was $1,000 a year, that would be okay too, or even 500. You know, any amount is, is going to make a difference over the long term. But he asks for three promises. And I, I just, I, I love what he's done. He says the first promise is that they're going to read. In fact, he recommends she read we're talking millions, uh, 12 simple ways to supercharge your retirement. By the way, for everybody who wants a copy, all they have to do is paulmerriman.com uh, slash uh, sign up and you'll get a free PDF that we hope you'll send to all sorts of your friends. But that's step number one. Step number two is that she cannot cash this out until she is 60 or more. And number three is that she has to do this for somebody later in her life and help somebody get started. And interestingly, somebody else who this gentleman did this with uh, had given money and that person got in trouble financially and really struggled but that person never cashed out the money that, that, that this gentleman, Kevin, 
had had given to them because they had made this promise. So uh, the, the, I really think the the real challenge is figure out how do we get this kind of commitment. Well, I think Chris, those numbers that you have, and and if you can, uh, does Daryl have to to stop? And yeah. Give it back to you. Yeah, Daryl needs to end share, and then we can I can share. No, yeah. great. Good. Because this table, I think, uh, would give anyone hope that this is not just a wild dream. So uh, what Daryl did was uh, based on assuming a 12% return. And um, what I was interested in was using the historical returns that small cap value has actually generated. And so I went to Portfolio Visualizer and ran a Monte Carlo simulation. And for people interested in how to do that, I will do a short tutorial uh, that we can either tack at the end of this or do as a separate podcast uh, to to show you how to how to enter everything to make it work. But one of the things that produces is a probability of getting returns greater than a certain amount at different points in time along the journey. And you can set the returns that you want to test for. And since I knew that small cap value, this is US small cap value, has a high historical return rate. I set the returns at 0%. So anything greater than zero means you haven't lost money. Um, 8%, 10, 12, 13, and 14. And uh, so if you look at you know the probability of not having lost money at one year, there's about a 25% chance you've actually lost money. And that's the scary thing about putting anybody in this kind of a plan is that they'll peak at a year and they'll learn the wrong lesson, right? They'll learn that, oh, I can't trust that asset class because it, it lost me money in a year. But if you looked at five years, there's only about a five to 6% chance that you lost money. At 10 years, it's 0.2% based on history and this Monte Carlo simulation. And by the time you get out to 20 years and beyond, um, there was no historical sequence of returns that produce a loss. Now, that's that's interesting. We don't wanna lose money, but the other end of, of things is also interesting. Uh, Daryl modder, modeled a 12% return. So what are the chances that somebody would really get a 12% return over Let's go out to 40 years. At 40 years, it's about a 75% chance they would get that. What are the chances they'd get a 14% return? Because historically, over the period of time that this asset class was tested here, 1972 to 2021, the CAGR for small cap value was actually 14%. Well, at 40 years, the odds of getting more than 14% after expenses with dividends reinvested is right around 50%. So, you know, is there a guarantee? No. Does past performance guarantee future performance? No. Um, but does the history suggest that this is a prudent strategy with a high likelihood of future success? Yes. Yeah, I think it does. And so um, I take some comfort in this. And like I said, for people interested in how to, how to run it, I'll do a little tutorial when we can uh, put that up too. Uh, I think that's that's great information, Chris. And and uh, probabilities are are always what we're we're focusing on because we don't know the future. Uh, and this is, uh, I think, a very thoughtful look back. What one might ask is how normal uh, the last fifty-two years or whatever fifty years that you have here, how normal that is. And if I'm not mistaken. When we go back to 1928, the average 40-year return for the S&P 500 is 11%. And over the last 52 years, we've gotten 11%. Now, the small cap value average is about 16% going back to 1928. And what you're noting is it was 14% over the last uh, uh, the, the last 50 years instead of 16%. So it may be 
that uh, the premiums in the future for small cap value won't be as great as they've been in the past. In fact, that's more than likely going to be the case compared to the S&P 500. But it does look at, at least as if that we could get that 12%. And of course, we're assuming the S&P 500 is going to be able to get 10. I think from Daryl's work on the 50-50 S&P 500 and the small cap value, during this period of time, that was a 12.7% uh, compound rate of return, as I remember from, uh, from his table. So even that could potentially, uh, in fact, it would be interesting when we have time in the future to run this kind of a question about that 50-50 strategy for people who are uncomfortable with the idea of putting their money in small cap value for the rest of their life. And by the way, we are talking about the rest of your life. We're not suggesting that money above and beyond this original $30,000 or $15,000, whatever you, you might be able to put away, we're not suggesting that you do everything this way. We are suggesting you consider this particular piece of the pie to be an equities forever strategy. And again, that is not unusual, although obviously what we teach is that when you're 50 and 60, you start adding bonds to the portfolio. Well, that could be with the rest of your portfolio. So, I mean, just for a second, Chris, because you've done all that work with two funds for life. Let's say that a young person does this aggressive, all small cap value, and puts that there for the for the rest of their existence. What would you suggest? How would you get them to form their their plans for the period following this first five years? Well, I I think that they have a lot of different choices. Um, I like the idea that people have something in their portfolio that reduces risk as they approach retirement, because uh, our, our behavioral capacity and our, our financial capacity, mm -hmm. you know, just time and money to, to overcome problems declines as we get older. And so I think it's prudent for everybody to have part of their allocation either in a glide path they manage themselves where they're increasing their their bond allocation as they approach retirement or in a target date fund and i'm a big fan of the target date fund because it's simple and odds are a lot of young people will be defaulted into it in their uh, 401k anyway mm -hmm. so if somebody has this uh, starter nest egg in small cap value and then they started investing in uh, the target date fund they could just go with that or if they want to, they could follow a two funds for life strategy and they could uh, allocate. Uh, the, the simplest thing is if they're saving 10% per year, you put nine pennies out of every dollar into the target date fund and one penny into small cap value. So you're continuing to increase your exposure to this <clears throat> asset class with a higher expected return. Uh, or they could use one of the age scaled approaches that I have in the book. Um, and in fact, the aggressive one kind of looks like this because it starts out 100% in small cap value. So they've already started out 100% in small cap value. And then it increases the allocation to the target date fund over time. And I think any of any of those strategies are, are prudent and possible. And it really comes down to personal preference and, uh, and tolerance for risk and willingness to manage things along the way. Because if you have, if you're managing a glide path, you have to do some rebalancing along the way. If you're just doing the fixed allocation, it's, it's easier to look away and just have it all be on autopilot. Um, but uh, all of the back testing I've done says that in the accumulation years, it's, it's going to help people take a little bit more risk when they can in the early years and have more in retirement if they allocate some to small cap value. And if they continue to allocate some to small cap value in retirement, it will increase the risk, but it, it will increase the volatility, but will actually decrease the risk of running out of money because it increases the safe withdrawal rate. Mm -hmm. 
So it's it's one of those weird things where it looks riskier because you have to tolerate a bumpier ride, but it's actually less risky because if you tolerate it with discipline, you're less likely to run out of money and and more likely to be able to spend more while you're alive. So it's so so you do this first five years, small cap value, and then you could go to a target date fund, which by the way you would at least historically, I think your studies show what, eight and a half percent without adding any small cap value? That sounds about right. Uh, the, um, the other way to look at it is if you look at the expected lifetime return for somebody who just saved in, in a target date fund in real terms, so correcting for inflation and looking at their spending power, if if somebody saves 10% into the target date fund across a 40 year career, and then takes out 4% fixed uh, withdrawals in retirement, it doubles their lifetime spending power, the expected lifetime spending power historically, which is um, amazing. Um, you know, you just think about that simple decision and two people sitting at their desks and one of them makes the decision and the other one doesn't and the one who doesn't make the decision to save for the future has this headwind it's it's like you spend your whole life with half as half as much spending power it just it doesn't seem fair but it's it's the way it at least historically played out yeah and daryl what about you you uh, in fact you you guided some young people what would be the next step beyond uh, this small cap value commitment. I think if if we talk if we think about the the five year study that we showed earlier, um, and the work that Chris showed, if you set that aside as a as a equity only only portion, you have said many times in the past the advantages that you that accrue to you by oversaving. So if you oversay, if you if you start this program off uh, in your first five years with the small cap value uh, Roth 401k, let's say, and then you supplement that, and it doesn't at that point it wouldn't have to be six thousand dollars a year, but if you supplement it after that with your, uh, your other portfolio that maybe is in a two funds for life uh, and maybe not a real aggressive two funds for life uh, if you want to keep that a more conservative investment um, and marry those two together. Um, I think I think you have a <laughs> it's a one two punch that can get you to the point to where you have oversaved and that's not necessarily a bad thing, as you've said in the past and so. Uh, I think this combination of, of an all small cap value, it, it's almost what Chris has anyway with his, like, I think he mentioned this even, it's almost like what he has with his, his aggressive two funds for life strategy. It's, it's a little bit, it's slightly different, but it's essentially the same thing. And, and that approach, I think, ha, can bear, uh, bear great fruit by the time you retire. Um, we had mentioned earlier that that how do how do you get people to to realize um, that that their little their little amount that they put in may or may not or may not seem like very much, but I think one of the things that that I've seen happen um, with with younger investors is that at some point, if you do peak once a year, let's say, and you look at your portfolio, at some point you'll realize that. The portfolio made more than you did in one year. And when that happens, that's kind of when the light bulb goes on and says, oh, wait, yeah. this may be a good thing. It takes a while to get there. Um, but that's but that's the both the frustration and the and the uh, and the the good side, I guess, of, of compounding uh, investments. So if you can. If you can get through that first decade or two and, and start to see how the how the the uh, growth starts to to approach or top what your what your your salary or your income is for a given year, um, then I think you're 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 home free at that point. Well, and the other thing I think we should mention to young people, 
uh, is that that first five years, you're going to draw all sorts of conclusions as to whether what you just experienced was good for you or bad for you, if you want to put it in good and bad terms. So let's say it looks like 1995 to 1999, where the S&P 500 compounded at uh, 17% plus, and small cap value compounded at 22% plus. Now, that would be a giant home run. And you would have probably have a commitment for life then that this is what you are going to do because you're off and running and there's no question. As a matter of fact, you know, you've doubled what we talked about uh, here in this conversation. But the other side of that coin, and it's hard for people, young people to get this, if instead of five great years, they went through five horrible years, I know how they're feeling. But the reality is, if the long-term market that is a series of cycles of up and down and a lot of sideways, if in fact you're going to have to go through those difficult times, what a wonderful time to be able to buy lots of cheap shares for the future that you're going to hold for another, what, 80 years potentially or something. So even bad results are in fact good results. And the other thing that I want to focus on for a second is the amount of money to invest. What I'm going to do for my granddaughter is put a little money away on a regular basis and get her up to the point where she will have enough money that it will self, it will fund that first five years. How much do I need to put away each month? It's about $25. And if I put $25 a month, and you could do that, you can do that at Fidelity, you can do that at, uh, uh, at Schwab, they have no minimums. And if you did, in fact, get a 12% compound rate of return, uh, that would, at age 21, cover the first five years of $6,000 contributions. In fact, I think you'd even have a little extra left over for almost one more year. And so this is not a matter of having a whole lot of money. I mean, it, it, again, here's teamwork. I made the comment that there's this, this partnership between this young adult and the market. And it's a lifetime partnership. But I'm talking now about a, one more partnership. And that's grandma and grandpa or mom and dad. They are a partner for a period of time until that then young person takes what they have thrown into the kitty and they move it forward to the next step where it becomes in partnership with Mr. Market, as, as Benjamin Graham called it. And then it hopefully works. And I think it's also important for young people to realize there are a lot of folks who look at the future and they say, this is grim whether we're talking climate change or political struggles or economic or the pandemic, whatever it is, it can feel like this just isn't the way it's supposed to be. The part that's the reality is if we go back and we recreate history, for example, starting in 1928, how do you think that turned out? Well, as a matter of fact, one of the best 50, 40 year periods in the market started in 1933. The very best 40 year period started in 1950. But right at the depth of that depression was a point at time, which from that point on, you made tons of money uh, co compared to what you expected because what you were in the middle of was a, a depression. So this don't peak, you guys are right on. And the reason you don't peak is because when you peak, you start putting all these stories we have in our head about what's going on in our life, what's going on in the country's life, what's going on in the world's life. 
and start having that color our thinking. And then we become market timers instead of buy and holders. And we really want you to turn all of that, that noise. It's real noise. It's not like it's uh, meaningless information, but it has little to do with that long-term uh, commitment. So uh, I, I just think this has got all sorts of, uh, of potential. And, uh, uh, and Chris, you've, you've done a little bit of this already and your family. And Daryl, you've done this with your family. Uh, and and I, I have. Some people know that I did podcasts and articles about a, a strategy that for each of my grandkids, I put away $10,000 into a crummy trust. That's what the, that's the legal name for it. And that money then was untouchable for them until they're 65. And that was then invested in a tax deferred variable, no load, variable annuity so that it would compound without taxation uh, for 65 until they're 65 at which point they legally, according to the crummy trust, are allowed to take money out uh, every year. By the way, that money would be very taxable money. And as I think it through and look at where we are today with what we have available, I actually think I like the idea of a tax-free strategy the only problem is I can't wrap it with a trust that, that requires that they can't touch it, guarantees they can't touch it, unless they figure out a way to cheat. They're not supposed to be able to touch it. And uh, I can't, we can't do that with a Roth IRA. Once it is in their account, it's their money. Now, I understand you can't open a Roth IRA when you're, a newborn child. There are actually ways you could, but few people will ever do this because you could legally pay a newborn child to be a model for uh, some sort of a catalog house and they could receive compensation and they could then put that money or their parents could match that money and put it in a Roth IRA, but under normal conditions. We've got to wait until the child, in fact, has some reportable income. It could come from mowing lawns. You cannot, I don't give tax advice, you cannot use uh, a, um, uh, now here's one of these old folks moments. Uh, Daryl, uh, tell me please what they call it when a parent gives an allowance. There we go, it came back, <laughs> an allowance. You cannot uh, use an allowance, but you can dictate that if you mow the lawn, we will pay you $10. And that $10, according to uh, accountants, is in fact legal income that can be used to put into an IRA. And you can match it. They don't have to put their $10. You can put the $10 in. So that does mean that for many people, before the child is earning any money, that money that's, that's, that's building there might throw off a few taxable dollars in, in, in uh, reportable income for you as the parent, if you keep this in your account. But I want you to keep it segregated so that you know that money is for that, that, that child or that grandchild. So there are a few little things we have to do but the payoff is just gigantic, I think, over time. And I will be criticized for these kinds of strategies. They'll say, you know, that's an awfully long time. I mean, why would you want to do that? Well, because the whole idea with investing is to figure out a way to invest for a really long time and have it grow and to have it grow tax-free. Who knows what the tax rate's going to be when these young people reach 65. It could be that it will be like when I came into the business in 1966 and marginal tax rates were 70%. The, 
The previous year, they were 90%. What a joy. I mean, this is not like we're cheating the government. It is just, this is their way of encouraging us to save for the future. What a joy to be able to take out all those dollars in Daryl's table and not have to pay a penny. And the other thing that I'll say, and, and the, we're going to talk about this another time, you may think that we're creating more than enough for these kids, and maybe they don't need more than enough. I recently was interviewed uh, uh, by a Boglehead a fellow uh, who runs the Boglehead San Diego chapter, John Lusk, and I made the comment. I want people who are working with the information that we provide to end up with more than enough. John Bogle always said enough was, should be the goal. And the reason I say more than enough does not have to do with greed, avarice. It is because we have goals, we have expectations. Most people who invest are optimistic by nature. And optimistic people often see life through rose-colored glasses. And then real life pops up and you have to face it. And sometimes real life does things to people that they just weren't expecting. And so the enough that they thought would get them where they wanted to go was not enough. And so my mantra really is, we want you to make more than enough. If that means, uh, like my wife and I are able to do, that you can give away to others. Chris, I know how you feel. Daryl, I know how you feel about this. That ability to give away often comes because you, by chance, ended up with more than enough. So, yeah, we may be helping some kid that's not going to need a lot of extra have more than they need. Hopefully they will follow us in terms of setting some sort of a, uh, of a history of integrity and, and, and a commitment to helping others. That would be nice. So uh, let's, I'm going to rejoice that they end up with more than enough because I'm optimistic that your kids, your grandkids are going to be good people and good things for other people. And I'm happy that because of the work that the three of us and, 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 and Craig Apple, who developed our, our, the Merriman Lifetime Investment Calculator. And by the way, can you see using that calculator to do some work to see what might happen with this strategy? What do you, you know, Chris, you've worked long and hard on it. You think it would be a good place to go to test this strategy? Uh, yeah, I, th I think you could do some work similar to what Daryl uh, what Daryl did. The tricky part is that so far it doesn't have the ability to automatically generate a lot of different scenarios. So you'd have to iterate yourself and kind of play with it and say, you know, what happens if I start this year? What happens if I start that year? And and find some lucky and unlucky scenarios. But uh, uh, the fact that it's the straight up real history is somewhat comforting. And I think a lot of people could learn something using it for that. Great. Well, if, do either one of you have anything to add that uh, just look at my list to make sure that uh, uh, I think we've hit most of the, Chris, you're going to do your follow up piece. Yep, I'll uh, do my follow up. Um, I guess I would just add that. Uh, you know, saving just enough sounds like the right thing to do, but uh, it, in practice, it's just not possible. Uh, I had a friend of mine say, uh, you know, these strategies that you're recommending to me, they all mean I'm going to die and leave somebody a bunch of money. You know, I just want to spend it all and then die without any. And I said, well, tell me when you're going to die and we'll come up with the right strategy. <laughs> you know, you don't know. Uh, and so the truth is almost everyone who makes it to the end financially secure is going to have more than enough because otherwise you'd, you'd die broke and yeah. there's no way to plan for that. Yeah. Great, great comment. 
Daryl, thank you for all the work you did on this table. Again, you've been, I think that table is going to inspire a whole bunch of people. And, uh, and, and do you have any comment you want to add? Well, I think, I think Chris is, uh, Chris and you are spot on when, when saying you should target more than enough because you never know what enough is. I have, I have friends who have parents who, who, I don't think they ever thought they would live to their mid nineties, but they have, and the bank balances are trending downward and it's not clear that they have enough. Yeah. And so, um, you know, the, you, the life, the ability to extend your lifetime is becoming, I don't, I wouldn't necessarily say easier and easier, but it's becoming, uh, possible that the, your life expectancy and your lifetime, the probability that you will live to old age uh, is, is potentially going to increase in the future here. And so I think <laughs> you need to be careful with the scenario that you plan for. You know, a long, a long time ago, decades ago, a couple decades ago, you planned for maybe 90 and then it was 95. And eh, maybe now you should plan just in case for 100, you know. What's it going to be in the future? And so nobody knows. And that's why, uh, you know, as, as much as I respect John Bogle, obviously, um, he's right. Enough is enough. It's just that you don't know what enough is. And so um, I think you have to be, you have to be your own fiduciary when you're putting your plan together and do what's the prudent thing. And I think the strategies that, that we've talked about here today with, with the, the chart that I showed and the, and the study that Chris showed gives you a chance to do that, especially if you can combine, uh, combine things in a prudent way, uh, with, as you mentioned, with your all equity and with the two funds for life, you have an aggressive strategy, a, a, a more conservative strategy, let's say. I think the odds of success are maybe good enough. <laughs> and, 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 you know, I, I, I think there are parents who may not want, or grandparents may not want to give this money now. Uh, there is one thing about this strategy. If you made a gift, if it, in fact, it was a real gift of this five-year commitment, whether it's $1,000 a year or $500 a year or 6,000, the fact is you have just given your child or grandchild something that could legitimately be worth millions and millions of dollars. And it may be that you won't have an opportunity to leave them much, but if you have left this, you certainly should not have a, 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 a feeling that you haven't lived up to the expectations of the family. I mean, you will have hit a home run. And for those who don't believe in giving this kind of money to young people, let me suggest you sit them down and say, hey, kid, I got an idea. I want to loan you money over the next five years. I want to loan you money so you can do something that I understand you can't do on your own. But it's just not my idea that you give money to kids, you make them earn it. But what I know is, is that if I loan you this money, $6,000, $3,000, whatever it is, and you are going to pay me 5%, I'm not going to want any money until at the end of this five-year period, and then I want you to pay me off over, I don't know, 20 years, 30 years, whatever it is, it'll be the biggest payoff you uh, as a bondholder will ever have <laughs> because you are turning, uh, you're going to get your profit. Your kid's not going to be given anything, but that child is going to ride a wave. Of course, it depends on the the future of this country, no question. But with all the tough hurdles we've had in the past, we, we, we've carried forward. And it always feels like it can't get any worse, but it carries forward. 
And I think the three of us and people who invest for the long time are investing with the confidence it will, in fact, uh, make it. So uh, I, I hope some of what we've talked about today will be helpful. Uh, I am so thankful, and I, I just can't express this enough, thankful for Chris and Daryl and, 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 and Craig and all of those people and, and, the, and the folks that have donated money. We are a 501c3 organization, uh, so it is tax deductible if you qualify uh, for that. And, and, uh, but the best thing you can do for us, the very best thing you can do is, is pass the work that we do along to others. Uh, it's an email away if you think it's information that would be helpful. And uh, Chris, of course, has his new book, uh, Relatively New. And uh, I, I know the reviews there are very good. I've, I've read them, every one of them, Chris. And, they're, and uh, you had a couple people who didn't like to go as deep into the topic as you went. But that's what people need to have when it's a lifetime a strategy that is as important as what you have included in your book, Two Funds for Life. And, uh, and, and of course, we want to get this, we're talking millions into the hands of as many people, which is why we make it free with the PDF. And oh, by the way, just as Chris and Daryl, they volunteer all these hours, every penny of profit that is made on the sale of any of the books that are being sold, uh, of, of any for many of us, it all goes to the foundation, uh, not not a penny to us. We are here, committed time and money to this outreach program, and uh, help pass it on. And thanks, thanks guys. And we'll be back. Got lots more coming up. Some hot stuff next week. We'll see you. And uh, oh, by the way. Let's see, will you have a chance? Uh, nope, you're not gonna get this before I do my Sacramento presentation. I'm sorry, uh, and, uh, uh, but we'll, we'll uh, check in as to when we're gonna be making uh, any public presentations or, or uh, Zoom pieces. Chris, have you got anything coming up? I know you're gonna have a release of Katie, uh, Katie's interview of you soon. Uh, but, we uh, did, yeah. That money with Katie uh, podcast came out this last Wednesday. Oh, great! And so, can they go listen to that? Uh, uh, I believe the... so. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, great. Well, you know what we'll do? Uh, if it's up now, we'll have a link at, in the notes to this uh, uh, to this this podcast, and uh, that'd be great. Look forward to hearing that. I have not heard it myself, so. Okay, guys, take care, keep up the good work, and stay well. And to you, too, dedicated students, good luck. It's Paul Merriman with Sound Investing. Sound Investing, soundinvesting.com, and paulmerriman.com are produced and exclusively owned by Paul Merriman, who is solely responsible for their content. For more information, free articles, mutual fund recommendations, and more, visit paulmerriman.com.